I am going to try and make this interactive. I'm notoriously bad at that, so interrupt me. If there's something you're uncertain about, speak up, because I will probably not notice. Um, also, most of the empty space in this room is right at the front. You'll probably get more out of it if you can interact with me, so move forward, please. <laughs> please. I feel like I've got bad breath or something. <laughs> Anyway, okay, that has not worked, so onward we're going to go. Okay, so I'm going to talk about interfacing to C using CFFI, which is a really nifty thing, and hopefully by the end of this you'll all agree with that. Okay, so why do we want to use CFFI? There are a number of ways you can interface with C. There's C types, there's things like Sison, there's the Python C API, um, there's Swig, and there are a few I've forgotten. So the underlying assumption about CFFI and how it works is that when you're dealing with this sort of interface, you should just be writing C and pure Python. You shouldn't be trying to write a domain-specific language, as you need to do if you're using Sison or if you're playing around with Swig, where you need to provide type maps and all sorts of things like that. Um, you really don't want to spend a lot of time learning a specific API to deal with this, something like um, C-types provide. You really just want to deal with the minimal set of information, which is the C library and your knowledge of C and Python. You want to keep the Python logic in Python. Writing Python in C, as you have to do for the C, C Python API, is actually kind of hard and boring and tedious and just generally an annoyance. You don't want to do that. Which, uh, that. And the other really the other nice thing about using CFFI is it's written by the PyPy people and it works great on PyPy. So if you're write, wanting to write interface to C library and you want it to work well on PyPy as well as work well on C Python, it is a very nice way of going. So the simplest example. If I can find where I am. Because I need to get it here. Yeah. Come on. Where? Where did that go? Made nice and large and then went. Come on. There we go. So this is straight from the CFFI docs. I want to, for whatever reason, wrap printf. So you import CFFI, you create the thing, and you provide that definition, which if you ever do man CFFI is exactly how it's presented in the man, man printf, sorry, is exactly how it's presented in the man page. You use that to load the library, I create a C string, and I call So this is a Python 2 um, virtual end with CFFI installed, because I want the latest version of CFFI, and the fact I'm running Debian stable on my laptop means it's not packaged for that. Um, but and it takes a little moment, but it gives you hi there, hi there world, which is the string O. Um, also supports Python 3, but this will fail because I have Because in Python 3, obviously, char maps to bytes rather than strings, but that's an easy thing to fix. Right, come on. Um, 
That's, you know, very simple, very straightforward. Um, there are a couple of um, subtleties involved. Okay, this is not a benchmark, but it's you know, comparatively slow. Um, the reason before that is this is completely in line. It does all the passing um, and extracting the necessary information from the, the, the libraries each time you run the Python file. Um, so you can use what they refer to as the build appro approach. Okay, this is still assigned that you do. That will compile a, a module which does the or create a module, um, don't you worry about Python, yeah. which does, um, pre-does the, a bunch of the expensive things. I should actually, so we have those files. And it creates a little file which is underscore demo. Which doesn't look particularly interesting, but is very useful to um, the CFI backend. And to use it, um, then from that file, I import FFI, I import the libraries, and the same thing here. And these still need to be need to be bytes because I'm still on the Python three virtual env. which is significantly faster. All right, um, that's, that though is dealing with the, uh, dealing with C at the ABI level, on the binary interface level, which is fine, you can do that, it's what C types does. And if you've ever used C types extensively in cross-platform situations, especially when you're dealing with libraries which are not totally specified by POSIX, so the structure before various um, system calls is not standardized across the different platforms you're interested in, you will understand that this is a very bad idea generally. Fortunately, CFFI also allows you to deal with C on the API level, which is usually a lot saner. Um, in this case, we are just going to do it using the out-of-line approach. So now I just add this set source line. That's essentially the rest of the same. Uh, typically, in, uh, typically in the examples, and it's a good practice to do, and I'm not doing it consistently because I'm a bad person, you would use, you would import FFI, you'd define this module as FFI builder when you're using it to build, and FFI when you're using it directly. In this case, I'm calling it FFI. Um, do, do as I say, not as I do. And now you see it actually builds a proper C module and compiles it. <laughs> okay. So you see, it's say building the demo extension calls the C compiler, and we end up with a demo C, a shared object, and the usual things you'd expect from compiling C code. Um, and this has an awful lot of the C file has an awful lot of magic in it, um, which largely comes. There, somewhere in the middle of the file will be what you've defined as set source will be dumped into it, which we'll cover in more depth later. But all of that is provided by CFFI. Using it works much the same, except now, instead of doing a deal open to get the lib, the library in, uh, object, I import it from that module, module I've just created. Uh, that works, and it's also you know, nice and fast. 
OK, that is boring as an example because there's nothing particularly interesting about printf other than the fact it's um, a varog's function. So for whatever reason, I don't trust Python's data, um, time module. So I trust the C library's time module, so I'm going to use get time to prove that the time module is wrong. OK, I obviously need to understand how. And so get time is that thing from the man page. So obviously, I need to know how those two structures look, because it's the, the ABI, which means I end up with this sort of chain of definitions. Um, I open that. I use FFI new to create, um, which is basically a wrapper around sort of Manoc, essentially. Works a lot like C++ is new. Um, that I call. I call get time of day, and I print that time. Uh, and I should just, since I'm criticizing, So let's call that. Um, oh, yes. Yep. OK, they are surprisingly close. I shall need more evidence. <laughs> Doing it using API mode. So this is one of the, the very nice things about doing it the API mode is we can rely on the C, P, the C compiler filling in a lot of stuff we don't care about. I don't actually care the, what the exact time of time t is. All I really care about is it's something that's kind of like an integer. So that's all I need to tell it. It's sort of like an integer. You can treat it more or less like an integer on the Python level. I'm interested in time val. I don't care about time, time zone. I just need it for the function call to work. Why do I need to waste time specifying, specifying that? So it's a structure. Fill in the details. OK, this time I was, I was a bit more careful. So we have that same thing. I create a time bell, create a time zone, call the thing, print out the comparison. Uh, that's me not being able to type. OK. This. Uh, so the really awesome thing about there is the amount of stuff I don't have to care about. OK, so that. OK, so I was basically trying to introduce the difference between the API mode, ABI mode, and the API mode. The ABI mode, it's the same sort of realm as C types. You're dealing with all the C API issues. And if you've ever dealt with C API issues and dealt with an undocumented breakage, you will understand just how bad an idea that is. And if you're dealing with something where there are multiple, ver where you need to work on platforms with multiple API, ABI versions, bleh. <laughs> there's a difference between out-of-line mode and inline mode. Unsurprisingly, out-of-line mode, out mode, where you pre-compile some or pre-compute some of the information is significantly faster. Yay. <laughs> API is closer to a more traditional 
Python module. You're generating C code, you're compiling the C code, you're getting a shared object. On the other hand, it's an AP you're dealing now with the API module, you can API level, you can ignore a lot of the ABI differences which exist behind the same API. So that makes life a lot simpler and a lot safer and a lot more fun. It does require compiling. Yeah. Um, API is, of course, not um, immune to sudden unexpected changes either, especially undocumented sudden API changes. But spotting a build failure is usually a lot easier than spotting a sudden surprise crash and working out what's happened. It's just so. I've just shown API is out of line. S uh, CFFI does support API as an inline thing. It's an old idea, it's deprecated, don't use it, but you might actually still encounter it in the wild. So be aware it exists and ignore it otherwise. So, on to something a bit more. Uh, go down one more level. How am I doing for time? Okay, I still don't trust the, the, the trust the um, the Python time module, but now I'm going to use a really accurate timer to prove that it's wrong, which will be POSIX timers. If you have a laptop out, um, it's probably a good idea to look at the man page because um, so. Okay, we'll skip that for the moment. Um, actually, I should, let me skip, let me do this. Okay, so the first thing is to create a timer. I want to go, it's this function. Timer create, you give it a clock ID, which is an opaque thing, which just identifies, well, which is a structure which import, it identifies what type of clock you're using. The signal information that's going to be um, sent when the timer goes off, and the time ID, which is just so I can hook up with it, look it up later. And the important thing is I need to link to the RT library, the real time library. Uh, there are a bunch of different clocks I can use. Uh, because it sounds appropriate, I'm really only interested in clock monotonic. Um, there are a bunch of different things I can do with the signal handler. I don't really care about sending a signal. I just want to be able to query the timer, so I only really want to bother about um, sig ev none. Time is set time. Okay, so the way you set and query a POSIX timer are these two functions. Timer set time sets, sets up the timer. Um, you give it the time ID, some flags. New value is the time you're setting it to. Old value is what it used to know and get time queries the current state of the timer. Um, the important thing is this time spec struct and the i timer spec struct, which is just two of the time spec structs. Um, flags are defined where? They're down here a bit. Um, Okay, so I really don't care about flags because I just want the, uh, that's only the, the absolute time. I don't really bother about that. Okay, so those are what I want to use. Uh, come on. I move stuff around so I can't remember where everything is. Okay. Now, I 
don't really like, I don't really need to expose the full timer create API. I'm only going to have one timer for this. I don't care about the type of clock. I don't care about the signal it's sending. Why do I need to expose that to my API? So I can create an API that matches my use case better. I'm only going to have one API. I might as well make it a global. I've already told you I'm a bad person. I don't care about the structure and the signal event, so I don't need to expose that. I just um, do handle that in the C level. Likewise, I don't care about the clock, so I can handle that about the C, about handle that on the C level. Um, so I have this function, which takes nothing and creates a timer with my specifications. But that I need to expose to the um, to the, the um, to the API. Likewise, I could expose my global timer object to the API. But I know what it is. I don't really need to be passing it around the whole time. So I also wrap get time to do that. I'm not going to bother with set time because um, I just want to query the timer. So all of that goes in set source, and that gets compiled into my module. So I've, def I've created a seaside API, which wraps the thing I'm interested in. And CFFI will compile it and handle for that. And then the CDEF, which is what I'm exposing to Python. Again, time t, I'm only really interested here that it's integer-like. I do need to know what time spec is. I do need to know what the I timer spec is, because those are potentially important. And then I expose the two functions I've just defined above. And then using it. So I call my timer create function, well, the imports, I call my timer creation function. I sleep for what time.time .time claims, it's, what Python time module claims is about half a second. I then query my timer, and this should now prove that time is incorrect. And hey, it does. I got that I slept for no time. <laughs> Except, of course, I obviously didn't. So I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> and the thing I'm doing wrong is I'm not actually calling set time. <laughs> So we need to, ah, we can make that mistake all day. So same, so I again need, so now I need to wrap set time, time is set time. I don't really care about old values, so again I do this on the API. I don't care about flags, I just set pass them as zero, but I do care about the new value, so that's I add it to the API, to my CDEF. So that's exposed. So now let's have a look at what I need to. So I'm sending, I need to send two values to, um, to set time. I need to set an initial expiration, exp initial expiration for the timer thing, and then how often it's going to fire thereafter. And if you look at the documentation for get time, get time will tell me the time until the next time the timer fires. Uh, again, I've done that. <laughs> So the interval, we go for a very long time. We don't really care um, because we just want to have some time that's much longer than half a second because we, um, we set a very short initial expiration time. We pass it to that. 
we sleep, and we query our timer. And since this is in nanoseconds, and my initial thing was um, 10,000 seconds, yeah, the timer also thinks we've waited for about half a second. <laughs> okay. So, you know, my theory that time.time .time is, that Python's time module is wrong is not getting a lot of support. Well, oh, sometimes. So, what was I doing? Ah, yes. Okay, so. Uh, yeah. So in this, I've been using FFI new, which creates, uh, allocates memory for C structure and gives you a handle on it. It's very important to be aware of what owns the memory. In this case, the memory is tied to the Python object. And when the Python object is, is deleted, garbage collected, your memory, um, then the memory is freed by CFFI. And if you're not thinking about this, you're not bearing, it can create all sorts of hard to debug issues because you're mixing C behavior with Python behavior and they're not the same and you will, you will hurt yourself. So let's do something, okay. Uh, I create, well, for whatever reason, I create a structure which takes two pointers to timers. The rest is the same. I, I just expose it in the API as well. So now, I do what is a bad idea. I allocate that and that. So Now, this will actually work because I've got these references A and B, and they hang around till the end of the program. OK, it's not particularly informative, but things have worked. But if I decide to refactor that and say, you know, it's really stupid, I'm going to be doing this a lot, we make it a function. Now, these handles A and B aren't going to be necessarily alive after the end of that function. And when I try and exit, I get a nice little seg fault. And because of the, especially in C Python, that the seg fault here is when I try and access it, it's a long time from where I created it. It's a long way away from where I actually introduced the bug, which is also true when you're dealing with seg faults in C. These can actually be really annoying to, <laughs> to track down. <laughs> Um, that, that's also true if you deal with seg fault and C. Uh, yes. You're still, at some level, dealing with C code. You can make the same bugs as mistakes you make in C, and they can be just as annoying to debug as they are in C. This is not actually a surprise, but it is a really annoying thing to realize at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so uh, be aware and be careful. Um, yes, that's, uh, something else I need to Demonstrate. Yes. Okay. Right. Now, if I decide that I actually want to change my API and I want to start passing that I actually care about the signal, um, we change that and I'll take a signal. 
I now expect the signal that, again, in this case, I only care about the type of signal and the signal number I'm going to be involved in. I don't care rest about the rest of the structure. The signal types are an enum. I don't care about most of them. Again, I can just rely on CFFI and the C compiler to fill in the stuff I don't care about. But these I do need to know, and those I do need to know, so I need to describe them in the API. Okay, in this case, I'm doing essentially what I did before, where I provide no information on the signal, provide no signal and such, and that should work exactly as before. Now I'm actually going to connect a signal handler. So I import the signal module. I trust the signal module. I don't trust time. Don't ask me why. I add a stupid function for the signal module. Um, that. I now say I'm wanting to take signal. I say sig user. I connect to signal um, sig user. And my signal handler was called a number of times while I was doing this. All right. Everyone following along? <laughs> Great. And what I wanted to demonstrate here. Um, um. Oh, something I forgot to point out. Um, the library I'm linking to, RT, which isn't mentioned the man page, that gets passed through to set source. By that, you can also pass through, you know, basically all the usual C flags. So the, the path to find include files, all the rest of it. Um, oh. Another nifty trick is I just don't trust the signal user that much. How do I know that this, its value of sig user 1 is actually sig user 1? So we can use define. Because um, CFFI is using PyC parser to handle this, what you can do that is actually very limited. You can't use arbitrary preprocessor instructions, because, well, arbitrary preprocessor instructions are totally crazy. But for numeric constants, you can do this, which is very handy. And it's usually all you want. If you want to use the full C processor stuff, there's a tool for that. It's called the C preprocessor. Um, everything else is the same as the previous example. Right. Um, save signal handler here, except now I take sig user one from the lib object rather than from um, from the signal module. And it works much the same. So takeaway points. The ellipsis in the CDEF, it's magic. It does all sorts of things for you, and it is absolutely great. Um, it's important to remember what owns the, the results of CFFI new, and it's your own fault if you get that wrong. All right. So what else can we do? Actually, at that point, let's do something a little bit, how am I doing for time? 
Okay, let's do something. So I don't know if anyone has ever looked at um, ti the tidy library for dealing with HTML. Okay. So the documentation for tidy has this example of how to use it. We that we call tidy create. We create our buffer objects. We pass an option. We set a buffer. We feed it into, into tidy. We call the clean and repair. We check if there were any errors. If there was an error, we do that to force, um, force the output, and we save, it, save the cleaned up thing into a to buffer. Run diagnostics puts the error messages in error buffer. That's documented somewhere. This is, so we're forcing it to create the cleaned up version rather than just um, failing and complaining. And then we display the results. And if things go wrong, we do that and then we clean up afterwards. So, as a somewhat interactive exercise, I have an example of how, to, how I did it, but oh, come on. That's all down here. Come on here. Why are you not going? And it also helps if I spell from correctly. So now what do I do? You're meant to be learning, so you're meant to be paying attention to the last half an hour or so and have an idea. <laughs> okay. Okay, the other thing is tidy lives on my machine, lives in the subdirectory, so I'm going to need to provide the same. I'll cheat and check how I did it. So I can never remember the exact name of that. So obviously going to need to and Mm. 
Mm. Alright, just grab this boilerplate. So how do I go on from here? I want to match my C function exactly. Let's say that. So obviously I need to start defining this, the same functions. So how are they defined? In this case, unfortunately, I don't have the man page, but I can look at the actual include file. Okay, so immediate thing is that tidy uses a bunch of preprocessor variables to handle various things. Eh, we don't really care about those. They have pain. So let's get what we actually interested in. <laughs> and, so, and that we do by using the C preprocessor, because that's what it's for. <laughs> so obviously I'm going to need tidy create, and that will have to go into the C diff. I'm going to need tidy doc. Okay, tidy doc is an opaque pointer to something. We don't actually care about the details, we just need to know it's an opaque pointer. I probably need the terminal. I need to fix this. I also need tidy buffer. All right, so it handles tidy buffer as a forward declaration, but doesn't actually tell me everything I need. So I've missed, I've obviously missed the, missed the something. And what I've missed is So I do need to know a little bit about tidy buffer because I need to get um, the bytes out. So tidy buffer is a structure with a pointer to bytes and other and some other stuff.
And I could expose that type of event, and byte is defined as type diff as unsigned char, which we'll also just use just because it's Don't care about anything else except my typing. I need tidy buff in it and tidy option set bool, and I need the <coughs> that's a bit of digging will reveal is an enum and I also need the See if I'm not making too many obvious mistakes. Uh, I've typoed something. It's always the problem of doing something live. I'm not. I haven't enabled the, virtu the virtual imp here. <laughs> that would explain a lot. the name, amongst other things. I haven't actually done haven't done the enum a name either. I think you need dot 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 here. Yes, I also need dot 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 here. Uh, Oh. Oh, yes, yes. I have not included buffer IO. That is an important point. <laughs> uh, mm. 
find the right. Yeah, uh, come on. And now, with some help from the audience, we actually have something that compiles and builds. <laughs> right. okay. and, but that is essentially how you go about developing the module. You start looking at the C code, you pull across what you need, and since this is taking, this is going slow, what you end up with at the end of the process is you end up with something like the appropriate includes, the definition of enum, also the bool enum, which I didn't get around to adding. Um, that because uh, tidy is a bit weird about things. And the functions I care about. This is by no means the whole um, everything tidy provides because tidy has all these character encoding things additional options and a whole lot of functionality that I don't actually care about right now so we don't expose them in the API and we don't ex include them in the CDEF so the C code that they provide, you pass it the input, it prints out a couple of warnings, and it prints out a nice cleaned up version. Oh, I've got to do that open number. That's not the file I wanted to open. And I write this because I'm copying the C logic and want something that looks a lot like the C file. This is, Py this is C written in Python. Do as I say, not as I do. And it's got essentially the same logic flow as the C file and very much the same structure. And behaves very much the same way. So that's from from that it's it's a little bit tedious because you go have to dig through either man pages or the, the include files or whatever to work out what you want from the API but it's not particularly hard um, despite mistypings and such we got to a point where we'd got the, the first thing done in a few minutes um, and that's without me pay that's me running on not much sleep and not actually paying that much attention if you had done this using um, the C Python API and written a proper C Python module, there'd be a lot more boilerplate and be take a lot longer. Um, C types would probably take about the same thing, but then you'd be dealing on the ABI level. You'd have to worry a lot more about the internals of the of the structures, um, things like the way we've handled the opaque pointer. Uh, just, yeah. Oh, a fair bit harder to do in, in C types because you need to, and things like this, you need to worry a lot more about the internals of the structure when you're dealing at the ABI level. So, okay. Um, all right. So, one of the things that it is often useful to do um, when you're dealing with a APIs, especially if you say interfacing with a widget library or anything like that, is you want to be able to provide callbacks. You want to be able to provide a function pointer to the API and have it called, and you want to write that function in function in function in Python. And so what we'll use for this is the um, glibc's um, binary tree implementation. glibc provides a balanced binary tree. You start it with a pointer, 
which I have defined up there as root. Um, T search is a bit misnamed. T search, you create a value, which in case is going to be a random value. T search searches a tree. If the value is in the tree, it tells you where it is. If the value isn't in the tree, it adds it to the tree. And then T walk walks the entire tree. Um, to decide whether something's in the tree, we need to provide this compare function, which is just compare. Um, usual minus one if it's less, one if it's one if it's greater, zero if it's thing. And action gets called with a node. Um, this enum visit and the depth it is in the tree. Visit takes four values. If you're not a leaf node, you can get called up to three times. So the way it's uh, is it calls you with pre-order before it visits the first child, calls you with post-order after it's visited the first child, but before it's visited the second child, and end or after it's visited the second child, and if it's a leaf node, it calls it with leaf. The GLBC people suck at naming things because this doesn't match anyone else's definition of post-order or <laughs> so on. So, but be that as it may, this is how it works. So we have a compare function. Our walk prints it if we, between the two children, and also prints it as a leaf node. Random allocation. And I get a random tree of numbers, and it prints them in order. Because it's, well, OK. So, start with this. So we'll start off doing this in API mode. So I set source. I have my includes. Um, all this stuff is defined in search.h. I end up defining the, the entire enum, because I want to mention everything in my if statement, I, in practice, if I'm going to duplicate the same logic, I only need post order and leaf, but yeah, it might as well do it all. And now I define the callback function, which is via extern Python. That there will be a function in my Python file that I'll link up to this my compare function, and likewise this my action thing. Um, and I define t search and T walk, again copying and pasting from the man pages. Uh, oh, wrong, wrong terminal. No, virtually I'm going. And so from that, I import there, I import the random module. And this is where I link it up. So it's this decorator, def extern, I give it the same name. There are ways you can, there are a bunch of parameters you can pass to def extern to change um, how it links things up. But by default, this is just the easiest. And likewise for my action. So compare gets, it gets two void pointers. I cast them to back to integers. So I'm casting a void pointer to an integer pointer, and then I need to dereference it, which you treat in the same way you can do it in C. You treat it as if it's the first index of the array. Um, this is a little weird because of the way the action function is de defined. What you get in node isn't actually the pointer to a node. It's a pointer to the pointer to the node, so you have to dereference it twice. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, but that's just the weirdness of the a actual underlying C API. And here I create the root node. I explicitly set it to null because uh, it needs to be null to start off the tree. I create a new thing. I assign it a random number in that range. I search it there. This is just to check whether it's gotten a duplicate. And if you remember my early discussion, 
because I'm using FFI new, I need to hang on to the references. So we just keep an array of the stuff I've allocated. And then I call um, twalk to print the tree. Uh, you built it. And very much the same thing. OK. And hmm. yeah. um, OK, there's something here to note. My compare is the Python function I've defined. It's still just a Python function. What I'm passing through is lib my compare, which is the CFFI structure, which then handles the fact which is a pointer to a function which ends up calling my compare. <laughs> um, that will blow up because that's not a, that's not a C function. <laughs> But this is, you know, um, that, that's in API mode. There's an alternative way of doing callbacks, which is worth mentioning, and I'm in the wrong direction. Yeah. I mode. All right, so same CDEF essentially. Um, again, we now we're back to ABI mode, so lib deal open. And now I have this FFI callback decorator, which says that this function matches that C prototype. And uh, that logic is all the same. So one important difference That is no longer the original Python function. It's now the wrapped Python function wrapped in the C function, as you can see from, the prints, from that, um, this print statement here, which is a distinction to remember when you're dealing with um, the one way of defining callbacks as opposed to the other. Um, all right, so that's that. Um, one thing I'm not going to demonstrate is an option for using extern Python plus C to define a function that's going to be callable both from Py both via Python or via C. Um, API. You can use these if you're doing it in API mode, but you probably don't want to. It's mainly useful. It's useful for API mode. It's useful for targeting older CFFI versions. There are several issues with the approach, the FFI callback approach. Um, look at the CFFI documentation on that. Um, on Unix, uh, sort of, it mainly triggers into you know, issues when you're running SE Linux, but yeah, it's things to be aware of. It's not um, flawless. Also, if you're dealing with Windows platforms, you're much more likely to run into issues with calling conventions because Windows, um, yeah. Okay. Right. So, okay. All right, I've recompiled it. Um, so, this is the same build object we had before. Doing it for integers is kind of uninteresting. I really want to really be useful, I want to also be able to pass actual Python objects through the callback functions. Of course, the, the underlying function in this case takes a void pointer, so because it's C, I can shove anything I want in there. So how do I get a, void, how do I get a Python object into that void pointer? So we define this silly node object, which when we create it gets two random numbers, has a consistent but bizarre compare operation and a string method. And the important thing here is my compare, rather than now casting this pointer, I use FFI from handle, which gives me back the Python object. Um, 
Here again, because of the weird way this, the weird way T works, work, works, we reference it that way to get something which we can get the handle to. I could all wrap this up into a single line, but it's yeah, longish line. That's the same. Now I create a node object. I get a handle using FFI new handle, and I pass that into the tree. But it's important that this handle also has a lifespan which is associated with the Python object, so I also need to keep references to the handle. <laughs> and that's the same. Voila. That's handing a Python object to a C function, to a C binary tree, and having it do the right thing. And most of the logic for, or all the logic for the Python treatment of this Python object lives in Python. The C, AP, uh, the C stuff, the C API I wrote there for the, the module, it's exactly the same as for the integer case. So in this case, the Python specific logic lives in Python, which is the whole point of CFFI. <laughs> uh, right. OK. Um, and here I wanted to say something about distributing. OK, so the one thing which is very simple, in ABI mode, distribution is simple. You just distribute the modules. You leave the user to, um, if you need to distribute libraries, you need to distribute those as well. The ABI compatibility requirements apply, but you leave that for the user to sort out. <laughs> yeah. Your users will love you if you do this. <laughs> OK. Um, API mode, the easy way is you, let the us you assume the user can compile the code. Um, that's, right, and it's um, very simple to, so, um, So we're returning to the demo for tidy. So now, uh, should just clean this up. So now I have the same um, tidy API thing I had before. I decide I want to wrap it up into something that's more objecty. So we have an init, and tdoc goes in there. It does all the magic in init. Um, I have a call to function. I define a method clean, which does that stuff and raises the runtime error if I do the wrong thing. And I can pull the errors that and del, del to clean up. Um, you can criticize the actual objectness of this, but it's you know, if object ish. Uh, and now my, and it's, I package this as a module, so I just have an init, which exposes my tidy object. And now my demo will now be that. So, I add a setup.py, nothing particularly surprising. The only important bit is CFFI provides a setup tools extension, which gives you the CFI modules. And that means that which you tell it the module, the build, and the object you're using. And that will handle, means that you can use setup.tools to do your module building for you. And you see, Setup Tools has built the library object for me. And there.
Uh, come on, no, that's. And if I point Python at that built module, it all works. And uh, with a little bit of, and if your user can, um, if you can assume that the user has the right stuff installed and be able to compile the module, you can just distribute the source module, they can download it, run set of tools, build set of tools, install, and everything will work. If you can't, if you need to provide um, by actual binary modules, then you are providing binary modules. And, yep, that's... Really, the, the best solution for that is wheels. Um, wheels are their own topic. There's going to be a talk about wheels later on in the conference, which, if you're interested in this, you should attend. Um, but again, the CFI setup tools support makes this very easy. I have... Uh, in the wrong... There. So there's no changes to the set of the pie. And I get a wheel. Um, again, that's just using the underlying setup tool stuff to create the wheel. And uh, so that's, again, CFI setup tools does as much for you as is sensible in this case. You've still got the issues of dealing with, you need to provide, um, if you are providing binary packages, you need to compile them for all the platforms of interest or get other people to produce them for all the platforms of interest, all the rest of it. Um, there's nothing that can be, there's nothing CFFI can do to solve that problem because that's just the nature of distributing binary modules. Um, where's my talk? Something more I wanted to say. Right. Okay. Um, see if I has very good documentation. If you have questions about it, read the docs. It really does that. Um, the Python CFFI group is quite helpful. If you have questions, um, ask, people will answer. Um, yeah, um, how are we doing for time? Hmm? Right. Um, okay, I had one more thing that was worth uh, demonstrating, that there are some very nice um, additional features go on. One that's quite handy is FFI new with an allocator, new underscore allocator. You, um, this is very useful for specify, dealing with libraries, something like glib or various other libraries which have their own special memory management functions. You can specify a function that will you know, do the allocation and you specify a function that will um, handle the deletion. Um, Another trick I didn't demonstrate is you can do dynamically sized arrays very nicely, just using this syntax. Um, new allocator returns something which behaves like FFI new, it just uses functions. If you specify none for both functions, it returns you FFI new. Um, you don't have to specify both, but the situations where you're only going to be specifying one or the other are fairly rare. Um, and also, it provides nice, um, the underlying, the Python side object behaves just like a Python array. So you get, you get an index error rather than an unexplained memory write. <laughs> um, okay. um, then the other thing which is sometimes useful is FFIGC. That gives you a copy 
of the C, C data object with uh, particular um, function that will be called when it goes out of scopes and deleted. Um, what I'm doing here is stupid and will crash because of how I'm doing it, but it demonstrates the point. Um, also, um, by default, CFFI clears memory when it allocates that. That's also something is behavior you can control with new allocator. Um, yeah. So, uh, this is very useful, to, as I said, this is for dealing with cases where you're dealing with libraries which have specialized memory management stuff, and it's very handy in those cases. Um, but if you do stupid things, you can still cause crashes. But that's, that's the nature of living in C. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Otherwise, I think we're over time, or about on time. So find me during lunch and ask questions. <laughs> Okay, thank you all. <laughs>